glasses on and go. This thing on is almost too much for me. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I got one of them off. Welcome to Worship at St Andrew's Church and it's good to see you all and to welcome those who are worshipping with us at a distance this morning. It's a beautiful day in Niagara the Lake and we're glad to be able to be here in fairly full health and uh, to enjoy God's presence and what God has for us to give us this day. I came across a definition of worship years and years ago that said, worship is a prescribed corporate meeting between God and his people in which God is praised and his people are blessed. I think that's a very good definition of worship. Um, I think I know everybody here, but if you are a newcomer or relative newcomer to St. Andrews and we don't quite know how to get in touch with you, please fill in the little purple card and put it on the offering plate when it comes. Um, if you ever do change your address, your phone number, your um, email address, even your name, <laughs> if any of that changes, please always let the um, church office know. Um, one of the reasons why we want to have updated information like that is so that we can send out the newsletters and I think that pretty much all of you will have received uh, St Andrew's Fall newsletter this last week by email uh, but if you didn't or if we don't have your email address you will find copies, hard copies on the table just outside each door of the Fall newsletter and pick one up as you leave this morning. After worship, uh, we hope that it is warm enough, it's lovely out there, so we'll, we'll be able to sip lemonade in the lawn at least one more Sunday, and then we'll see just over the next week or two how we do with transitioning to coffee inside. But we'll, uh, we, we can do that, but there are regulations around it, so we'll just take that as it comes. And Matt Vazari, over here in the corner, our Knox College student, is going to begin a fall Bible study. And so he is anxious to meet those who might be interested in joining him for that together. And he will meet you, well he'll see you after church today, and he'll also meet you next Sunday after church as well. For if you'd like to be interested, he'll tell you more about it. Um, next Sunday, the Sacrament of Holy Communion will be celebrated at our <coughs> morning service. And then the following Sunday, it's hard to believe it, but it's Thanksgiving. Um, and so because it's Thanksgiving, it should be the sort of Sunday you are inviting half the world to come. Don't look at me like that. You are going to invite people to come. Any Sunday it will do, but Thanksgiving is a wonderful Sunday to invite people to come. Now my question for you is this, and you can either put your hand up if you think it's necessary or not, but do you require from me a written lovely invitation to use or can we dispense with that and can I trust you to do your invitations verbally? Which is it going to be? Okay, now take all notes of all the people who are saying verbally because if they don't have somebody with them in church on Thanksgiving, they're fired. Anyway. So, okay, we'll do the verbal invitations. That's a wonderful Sunday to invite people to come and worship God and give thanks. So that's two weeks from today, Thanksgiving. Um, I think that are all of our announcements. We now take a moment to prepare for worship. The Eternal Father, who loved us and set us free from our sins, who loves us still with that love that will not let us go, and who will love us forever, calls us to worship him today as the only true lover of our souls. The Lord stoops to receive the love of our poor hearts. He calls us to remember the depth of his love for us in Christ. God seeks our love.
Let us pray. Holy God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, you are perfect in wisdom. You are faithful in love. You are relentless in seeking peace. When we feel alone, you offer community. When we face pain, you give healing. When challenges surround us, you give courage. When we work against each other, you urge peace. Glorious God, you are the source of all grace and all goodness. We come to worship you in gratitude for all that you give us. Receive our praise this day and renew us to serve you in the world that you love. Generous God, your mercy became flesh in Jesus, yet we confess that often we hold grudges or cling to the past. We focus on our differences and what we lack compared to others. We resent the gifts that others have instead of appreciating our own. We turn a blind eye to sin, both in others and in ourselves. We fail to recognize the good that we see, both in others and in ourselves. Lord, we pray for forgiveness on this day and pray for the strength and the courage to follow the teachings of your Son, Jesus. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us, and Christ prays for us. Believe in the good news of the gospel. In Jesus we are forgiven and made new by God's generous grace. Amen. <coughs> Of this morning, you'll find a little brochure called Presbyterians Sharing. Most of you here this morning will have heard that phrase Presbyterian Sharing for decades because it's the name for the budget. Very exciting. It's the name of the budget for the Presbyterian Church in Canada. And I, it, I don't think I found in this book what that actual budget is, and maybe it's because of COVID and everything's here and scared, but it usually is between 9 and 10 million a year, which is raised by congregations like ours across Canada. Presbyterian sharing is, covers a multitude of sins. It's what is spent on ministry and mission by the National Church across Canada and around the world. It's a big budget. And it's one that Presbyterians support every year. Um, and the opening page, if you just go over to pay, over the opening page, at the very beginning it says, when we give to Presbyterian sharing, we participate in God's mission together, expressing our faith through our actions and decisions. While the way we do ministry is constantly changing, we continue to proclaim God's love, hope, faith, and grace in the world God loves. If you go to a, a later page in this book, and I don't want you to read it necessarily, but well, certainly not during the sermon, but um, do take it home and read it. But if you look later on, it breaks down the budget into saying that 59, 60% goes to ministries across Canada. Another, what is it? I can't find my page now. Is it the next page? It would be, the next page. 14% goes to international mission. 12% of our budget goes to indigenous ministries and the rest on various administrative governance and justice issues. Across Canada, how do you start a new church? 
It's often started at the initiative of local people, but it's supported by what we give to Presbyterian sharing. How do we support congregations, scattered, remote congregations that cannot support themselves? We give to Presbyterian sharing so that they receive a grant. How does someone like Matt Bazzari receive a theological education at one of our colleges, Knox College or in Toronto Presbyterian College in Montreal, yay, and um, there's an Andrews Hall in Vancouver, by what we give to Presbyterian sharing. Ministers don't just pop up. They have to be trained, and that takes a lot of work. Presbyterian sharing, what we give, helps support the, the training of ministers like Matt. Who, by the way, is here for the year, but doesn't receive a penny, and isn't allowed to. Although we, I keep on thinking of some way to circumvent that. But anyway, Matt is our responsibility. There's 101 ways in which the Presbyterian sharing budget is used, and it's used very discreetly. I've worked in Presbyterian committees <laughs> and structures for the last 40 years. It's all done on the cheap. You know, I always envy, I'm sure there's something in your prayer about not envying the gifts of others, but I also envy people who have jobs where they went for, uh, you know, renewal programs and they stayed in hotels in Niagara Lake. You know, ours were always held in church basements, you know, just cheap. <laughs> That's what Presbyterians do well. But it's because we're spending the money you give. And then there's overseas ministry, translating the Bible for the happy people of Taiwan, helping children with AIDS left behind by parents who died of AIDS in Malawi. It goes on and on. I want you to use this and read it to fire your imagination that by supporting and praying for the ministries national and global of the Presbyterian Church, you become a partner. You become a partner in ministry and in God's mission. Because we can't all do what Matt's doing. We can't all head to Malawi. But we can all be part of it by participating, praying, acting, and giving. That's what Presbyterian is all about. And when you think about it, it's actually, to me, quite exciting. You're part of something bigger than St. Andrews. By the way, I'm not telling you to... to Retrieve what you give to Fox and Andrews and give to Presbyterian Church and ask me to add. <laughs> and I think, I think I'm right, and I could be wrong, so I, I, did, I forgot to check this, but I think our budget is over 200,000 a year. What we give to Presbyterian Church is about 17 of that. Uh, I could be, stand to be corrected. And that figure should probably go up, but that's up to you and me. We're part of God's work in this world. I commend this to you. We're going to sing a hymn now that gets us, really gets us to verbalize our partnership with God in the ministry. It's number 585 in the hymn book. Now, today I don't have a word with the children, but I see a few of them here. So as you come up this aisle to go out to Sunday school with Ashley, I'll give you a high five. So well, let's sing together. And if you want to join the first verse of 585.
speak to us. Let us begin with a prayer. Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. By your spirit, Lord, apply your word to our lives this day so that we walk with you and witness to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are going to begin with the Old Testament reading, Psalm 119, verses 1 to 16, and it will be read responsibly. Page 436. Psalm 119, beginning at verse 1. Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep the statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame. When I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not have to be me. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not have to be straight from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. And then turning to Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 30, and verses 38 to 42. If you wish to follow, that will be on page 683 in your pew Bible. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully 
has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. This is the word of the Lord. Him, 
king of God's kingdom. And as king of God's kingdom, he has the right, the right to rule our lives. If you look at the opening chapters of Matthew's Gospel, the accent is throughout on Jesus the King. In Matthew chapter 1, Matthew very carefully links Jesus to the royal house of David. In Matthew chapter 2, he tells us about wise men from the east looking for the newborn king. Matthew chapter 3 tells us about John the Baptist, the great prophet, but who said, I'm not worthy to even stoop to unbuckle his sandals. And Matthew chapter 4, which we looked at a little bit last week, reveals Jesus with the kingly power to heal and with the authority of a king to call people to leave everything and follow him. In Matthew chapter 5, the passage we read, it's part of the Sermon on the Mount and throughout the Sermon on the Mount spells out for all of us what life ought to look like if Jesus is in charge of our lives. It's a blessed life, but as if you're paying attention to the reading, it's not an easy one. Who or what rules your life? In today's text from Matthew chapter 5, Jesus, aware of his authority as king of God's kingdom, assures the crowd that as he speaks, as he preaches, he assures the crowd that, that though a new day has dawned, because he has arrived as king of the kingdom. Yet at the same time, he says, my message is rooted in the Old Testament. I'm in continuity with the Old Testament. And so he says here at verse 17 of chapter 5, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I've come to bring to realization the whole intention of the Old Testament. The whole intention of the Old Testament. Sure, we all know that the Old Testament differs from the New in many ways. But it differs in the same way that a bud differs from the flower that will finally issue from it. We're not said Jesus, we're not to set the Old Testament aside in favour of the new, as some Christians often do. Rather, he says, to understand me and my message and my ministry, you need to read me in light of everything that's written in the Old Testament. And by the way, that's precisely why in Presbyterian worship we always read from the old and then we read from the new and that's a wise thing to do I think it was Martin Luther who's credited with saying this the new is in the old contained the old is in the new explained isn't that a good little thing to remember the new is already in the old contained as a bud the old is in the new explained. Jesus, therefore, honoured the Old Testament. And yet, this must be true. At the very same time, as Jesus said, I am in continuity with the Old Testament, the law of the prophets, I am not here to abolish them, but he also claimed the authority to reinterpret the intention of the Old Testament. It's an astonishing claim to make. And it makes you ask the question, who did Jesus think he was? Who is Jesus? That question is raised, of course, in all sorts of ways throughout the Gospels. A mere religious teacher, or even a prophet, would never have made the claim that they will interpret, they will reinterpret the Old Testament. But Jesus made that claim. And he made that claim. 
And Matthew's Gospel pushes it forward. So does the rest of the New Testament, such that the church universal confesses that Jesus, prepared for by the Old Testament, is none other than king of God's kingdom, with the authority not just to reinterpret the Old Testament, but with the authority to rule your life and mine. Indeed, everything. So are you ready for Jesus to rule your life? Today's reading from Matthew chapter 5 spells out what it's like to have Jesus rule our life in relation to a number of things that often try to rule our life. Jesus mentions about six of them. Not all of them we covered because I don't have time in one sermon to do it. But he mentions what? Anger? That threatens to rule our life. Lust. He also mentions oath-taking, hate, and revenge. Let's look at three of those. First of all, Jesus begins with this. You have heard it said in the Old Testament, do not murder. But I tell you, I tell you, he says, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Jesus, of course, is here quoting the Sixth Commandment, one of God's precepts, commands, that we are supposed to uphold. Do not murder. Or, as it used to be in the King James Version, thou shalt not kill. But the thing is that Jesus reinterprets it. And he says, folks, if you simply do nothing but refrain from murder, you haven't necessarily fulfilled the intention of the law. I tell you, he says, that anyone who is angry with a brother or subject, or, or sorry, a brother or sister, is subject to judgment. What God intended with this law wasn't just that we don't kill, but that we get rid of the anger that makes us want to kill somebody, or even or do some other lesser harm to them. Hands up who's never wanted to kill somebody. Don't answer that question. <laughs> A minister once asked his 10-year-old son to read the Bible at Sunday worship. The text assigned to the kid was this, Matthew chapter 5, this passage, which led the boy to send a text message to his dad. And it went like this, Dad, I read the bit where Jesus says not to be angry. You know the passage, don't you? <laughs> and then he goes on to say, do the other Gospels have that passage? I ask this because, no offense, Dad, but I think Jesus was wrong. <laughs> we all identify with that ten-year-old boy. Because the thing is, anger has been and remains part of our lives. It's a stubborn part of our lives. It's there. But Jesus says the intention of God's law isn't just that we don't murder, but that we don't have the anger inside our lives to do it. So is Jesus wrong? Must all anger depart from our lives if Jesus is really good? It's probably worth noting at this point that the present tense particle verb that Jesus uses for being angry might be better translated as if you continue to be angry, if you remain or retain your anger, you'll be subject to judgment. If it's an ongoing thing that you hold onto, you'll be subject to judgment. And I think that's a good way of understanding that verse. It aligns, by the way, with what the Apostle Paul later wrote in Ephesians chapter 4. Do you remember what he said? Be angry, but do not let the sun go down on your anger. Don't hold on to it. Don't nurse it. That is, rather than forbidding all anger or calling all anger necessarily sinful, Jesus forbids us from holding on to anger or letting anger hold unto us, ruling our life. As we all know, anger destroys things. 
as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 here at verse 22, a person who angrily calls another person a fool is in danger of the fire of hell. It sounds a bit over the top, doesn't it? Dale Gooder, a Presbyterian commentator in the States, writes this. He says, there are people in mental wards because hateful words are lodged in their psyche like bullets in a spine. Words that question our character hurt deeply. Marriages are decimated by anger. So are families. So are friendships. So also are congregations. The issue for Jesus is simply this. To be his disciple, to allow Jesus to rule your life, means that we can't let anger rule our life. But that we must go and reconcile with those with whom we're angry. I can't do that for you. I can only contemplate doing it for me. But it has consequences. There are things we need to do. It has implications for how we live. Now, that was pretty tough going, but here comes next. Jesus tackles lust. We thought this was going to be such a pleasant Sunday morning. <laughs> if you think anger is tough, it gets worse. For Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 says, You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. I'm old enough to remember the political storm that Jimmy Carter caused when he told a Playboy magazine that he was guilty on this particular charge of what was going on in his heart. Jesus, of course, here is quoting now the seventh commandment. The seventh commandment that forbids adultery, the point of it was to keep marriages faithful. To keep marriages faithful. Jesus, however, again radicalizes the command by arguing that faithfulness isn't just a matter of avoiding adultery, but it's rather about controlling the inner power of lust that may lead to adultery. You see what he's doing? He's internalizing the issue again. Not just murder, but anger. Not just adultery, but lust. Here's my question. Does that make Jesus anti-sex? <laughs> Not at all. God made us so that we're able in sexual union to create life. None of us would be here this morning if it wasn't for sex. And sex also in the Bible is not just about reproduction. It's also about delight. And if you don't believe me, read the Songs of Solomon and how it celebrates lips, limbs, legs, and everything else. But what differentiates legitimate sex from illegitimate lust? Again, let's note the verb that Jesus uses at verse 27 for looking at a woman lustfully. Again, it's a present tense participle verb. That means what he forbids is looking at each other, not, not forbidding looking at each other and finding the other attractive, but rather lust is lingeringly longing and wanting to control the other. That's what lust is. With lust, writes Dale Bruder again, the other person is no longer a unique human being. She or he is now simply kindling tinder, a way for one to enjoy oneself. So what are we supposed to do with lust? Here's Jesus' answer. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now before I get any complaints, you do realise Jesus is being, what well, the right word would be, hyperbolic. He's not saying 
folks, I want you to go and dismember yourselves. That's not what he's saying. And only the most silly interpretation would take this as a, in a literal way. Brother Jesus is saying, you must take decisive action in your life against lust. You must amputate lust from your life. If that means bringing an illegitimate relationship to an end, you must do it. If I rule your life, it means you must block some particular internet site if I rule your life. Do it. By the way, Jesus does, does us the honor, the honor here of assuming that we're not helpless victims when it comes to lust. And that we have the right and the necessity and the power to not let it rule our lives if there are people who are following Jesus as our king. Okay, we've got two out of the way. Anger, lust. Here comes the third. Verse 38, we turn to revenge. Revenge. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Anger can take hold of our lives. Lust can take hold of our lives. And so can revenge. Which is the desire to go through life getting even. And that revenge too ruins lives. But just for a moment, let's think about the Old Testament command. It was part of Old Testament law. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That particular law was and remains a pillar of public justice because it established the principle that the punishment must fit the crime. If someone damages your eye, says the law, you're not allowed to go and kill them for that. The punishment must fit the crime. That is, the person who did that must be punished by receiving the judicial equivalent of a damaged eye. Do you see the, the point that the law has? It was a very advanced, civilized law in the Old Testament. And Jesus doesn't teach here that we're to do away with that judicial equivalency argument when it comes to public justice. What he does teach is that this principle of judicial equivalency doesn't apply to how we treat one another in personal relationships. And that's what he's talking about here. He said to his disciples, the public courts may be the place where you seek justice, but if you're personally insulted, don't return the insult. When you're personally struck, do not strike back. I've never seen this movie, but I've heard about it. It's called 42. And it's about the famous baseball player, Jackie Robinson. And in the film, the amount of abuse he received as a black man playing a white man's game is revealed. An angry Jackie Robinson once went to his coach and said, Do you want a player who's got the guts to fight back? The coach replied, I want a player who's got the guts not to fight back. Jackson adopted, personally adopted, that non-retaliation policy. And it was from Jackie Robinson that Martin Luther King picked it up. It's how those living under the rule of Jesus are to live. Do not resist an evildoer, said Jesus. So are we supposed to just do nothing? No. Jesus said, if an, evil, uh, if an evildoer strikes your, you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. If anyone wants to sue you, take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Don't just stand there, confront the evildoer. But doing so in a subversive, non-violent way, God's way. So what rules your life? Who or what rules your life? 
lose my life. Anger, lust, revenge. Let me end with this. First, the bad news. We all struggle, don't we? We all struggle with these commands of Jesus. And frankly, we always will in this life. But here comes the good news. Though Jesus wants to rule your life and mine, it's not our ability or our inability to keep his law, to keep his prefects, that makes him love us. He simply does and walks with us, walks with us, supporting us through every struggle we face. Until one day the struggle ends and we will perfectly keep God's law. Amen. The Anthem.
the offering, Lord God, we receive. us and illumines our path. As we begin another week, there will be new opportunities for us to allow Jesus to rule our lives. Help us this week to not let anger take hold of us. Help us to meet others, whether friends, family or neighbours, with patient grace. And may those same people see that you are controlling our lives, not anger or lust or revenge. Gracious Father, give us the mind of Christ as we look out on our troubled world. Let us rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Today we rejoice with all who welcome home Michael Corvick and Michael Spavor, set free from an unjust treatment. But Lord, we also weep for those around the world who are jailed, even though innocent, some of them being our fellow Christians. Lord, we rejoice that billions of people are vaccinated to slow down the spread of COVID-19. But Lord, we pray that the destruction caused by untrue conspiracy theories will end. Lord, we rejoice in the willingness of so many who work in hospitals to risk their lives to help those who are ill, but we pray that they may not be overwhelmed in body or spirit. We pray too for the Presbyterian Church across Canada. Lord, uphold long established congregations that struggle to survive. Bless those congregations that are just beginning, and lead all congregations to find their life and hope 
in Jesus. And Lord, help us to see ourselves as partners with others, near and far, who will never meet, who are contributing to Presbyterian sharing. And now in silence, we bring our personal prayer of thanksgiving or supplication to you. Lord, hear our prayers through Jesus Christ, who taught us when to pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Thank you.